Are you on? Where are you? Oh, yes. You are going to go. Uh, next is Ravi Gomatam, who not only is giving a talk, but is responsible for much of our organization and therefore also our disorganization. So uh, here he is. <laughs> Perestroika. I suppose I I'll try it from here, it's, it seems. Yeah, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So, the topic of uh, mind, consciousness, matter, and uh, the interrelationship between these aspects of reality is, of course, a very profound one. It has occupied the uh, attention of mankind uh, for a long time. So I don't hope to be able to provide any definitive answers, but specifically from the context of work with an artificial intelligence, I hope to be able to uh, present to you some discussion which should give us some possible ideas for mind and consciousness. The uh, lecture should go, uh, the presentation should go in four phases. In the first phase, I, uh, I shall review some problems of AI and try to extract some pointers. Um, in the second phase, uh, I will give a very brief review of uh, materialistic theories of mind. And uh, in the third phase, I shall propose a new concept for mind in terms of symbol processing specifically mind as a level of symbol generation and just briefly talk about uh, the potential applications of this idea. It's no secret that uh, the history of AI has been beset with uh, different kinds of problems, uh, some technical that have been overcome uh, since they appeared and some very deep and fundamental and persisting. Uh, here is a little quotation from Peter Dunning, director of AI at NASA. And he asks that, why is it so difficult to elicit intelligent behavior from machines? Is it poor engineering? Or is there something fundamental that puts the goal beyond our reach? Obviously, right here, we have two ways to go about the kind of problems we face. And I will straight away grant that there is nothing in our uh, knowledge right now to say it's one or the other. It's very possible that the kind of problems that I'm going to discuss now are entirely solvable within the realm of uh, better hardware and newer software schemes. But, they, but then again, they may not be. Um, 1950, I think uh, Minsky wrote an internal memo at MIT where he predicted that uh, by 19, uh, the end of uh, the 1980s, um, he thought that uh, uh, AI would produce um, computing systems with so much intelligence that they will uh, you know, far um, outstrip human capabilities. And uh, I think most of us would have noticed that has not quite happened. <laughs> so, uh, of course, this tendency to uh, think hopefully in terms of the ongoing existing technology to understand the nature of inner essence is, uh, is a persisting one. And today, the fashion with an AI is, of course, has been for a while to consider mind as a computer. But then a little earlier, we used to think mind was a steam engine. <laughs> and a little before, mind was thought of as a clock. And uh, before, mind was even thought of as a catapult, you know. Probably the closest to what mind is, actually. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, so and, to, and of course, um, over uh, uh, yesterday, uh, and a good, uh, you know, we have also seen uh, attempts to consume the uh, uh, the nature of human cognition within um, brains. Yeah, so I'll I'll be touching on them at one point. There are two areas of 
uh, difficulties in AI implementation that I want to specifically touch upon that seem to tell us that there may be something uh, uh, beyond simple processing that's associated with our cognitive processes in the brain. One is generalization, the other is categorization. The generalization is, uh, can be simply t uh, thought of as the ability of human beings to uh, treat as equal non-identical data. You know, that's in, we are able to generalize. You know. It is also uh, an ability to uh, extract uh, meanings out of signals that are not entirely local to the signal. I shall talk about it a little later. But to give a more uh, simpler way to understand the skill of generalization, a favorite uh, description of mine is one that Jeffrey Hinton gave, uh, where he gave the uh, example of how, uh, when we have different conditions uh, with which we search, a computer would normally uh, fail if all the conditions are not met, whereas the human beings can generalize even if one or two conditions were wrong. For example, I might say, uh, former president of ESA, intelligent and a movie actor, even though one of the conditions is wrong, most of you would know, you know, who you're talking about, right? So, uh, so here is uh, uh, a little bit of a more uh, closer to AI kind of uh, example. You see a picture, most of you might be familiar with this, and you, this character could be a stylized A on an H. And depending upon the context, you know, we see this as an A or as an H. Now, uh, there are fundamental difficulties in developing a generalized way of treating this class of problems. Of course, we have, you know, specific uh, areas where knowledge intensive methods are uh, implemented that can do this. But they always have certain limits. I shall speak about it a little later. And uh, it seems like, you know, this kind of being able to uh, get some information uh, in a context by relating it to the environment, uh, we are able to do that well because we hold uh, for ourselves a context uh, within the environment in which we live, which uh, could be uh, very closely tied with the nature of our consciousness. I just wish to, in order to uh, give uh, the depth of the problem that we are talking about here, give a slightly different example, which is more profound. Uh, this is in Edelman's book on neural Darwinism. You see a picture like this. Uh, uh, you see something, and when you see uh, the poem that's attached to that, a whole different kind of meaning emerges. You know. Uh, so it's not very, uh, you know, frogs eat butterflies, snakes eat frogs. If you see, there is a, a pig here, you know, and the frogs are eating butterflies, and the snakes eat frogs, right, and man eat hogs, and you can see that. So it's, uh, now it's, it's very difficult to see how this kind of thing actually we're going to be able to uh, make a computational system work. Of course, um, I must say, that uh, there are a lot of ways in which there's partial success using what I tend to call as an enumerative approach. In this approach, we try to build as much knowledge about the problem domain as possible, and usually these three questions are asked. Uh, I hope you'll overlook the spelling mistake there. What knowledge is pertinent to your problem? How should that knowledge be represented? How and when that knowledge should be used? These are the kind of questions that are generally asked within AI. And I call this what I call as a knowledge-intensive approach. I think most of you can intuitively relate to the validity of uh, uh, this kind of a formulation, where we have systems where k tends to infinity and i tends to zero. We try to put as much of knowledge as possible, and obviously the amount of intelligence the system needs to have to solve the problem is very little. You know. And this kind of uh, approach does succeed in limited areas. I shall come back to this slide a little bit later. And uh, however, um, it's, uh, it's much like uh, most of you will be familiar with an LSI type of, type of program where you just search for sentence templates and there is uh, the right kind of input-output pattern is established. But when you really see how the system is doing it, you see that all kinds of knowledge that's needed is built into the system and the system is really not having what you would call intuitively intrinsic knowledge. You know. it's, uh, it's just like probably 
two students who write and uh, answer a question paper. Both of them give the same answers. And you find one answered it himself, and the other person copied from the book. You know. So although he got the right answers, you don't w wish to say that he is uh, you know, as intelligent as the other boy. So here is a, a very nice summary of the status from uh, Feldman in Theoretical Issues in Natural Language Processing, where he's talking about how uh, there then came a concerted effort, actually early efforts, uh, efforts in machine perception. Uh, they, they, they used lot, all kinds of you know, line generation and all kinds of mathematical techniques. You know. And they found that uh, these kind of uh, systems that you produce, they're typically suitable for micro world application. They don't have any upward mobility. You, know. you can't expand them, generalize them. And uh, so Feldman here remarks that there came an effort to overcome or circumvent perception problems by giving programs lots of domains of knowledge. This has been carried to the extreme of visual perception without vision. So what I'm talking about is actually we may be able to. Um, indeed, the current level of computers are not very sophisticated. And it's very possible that as we understand more and more of the structure of the brain, we would be producing uh, better behavior. But my uh, contention is that all of this uh, would probably still remain under this knowledge intensive mode. And we could consider an alternative mode. And what this means, we'll see a little later, where we have um, the knowledge that we supply to the system to solve the problem becomes as less and less as possible. And then obviously, the system ought to have uh, you know, increasing degrees of intelligence to solve the same class of problems. So we might then think intuitively, is there a way to categorize these uh, uh, two ideas? Mm. So I already mentioned about the problems of the enumerative uh, approach. And uh, when we consider this, uh, an important aspect is we can see here a fundamental difference between human learning and machine learning. We do have systems that learn things that, uh, you know, using this K uh, approach, K intensive approach, but they really cannot expand to other contexts which are not built in. But human beings, we seem to be able to do this. For example, you teach a child how to eat at home, you know, when he goes to the restaurant, is able to somehow use this knowledge to eat there, although it's a different situation. There is an ability to generalize and go up and expand, which seems to be an in, uh, intrinsic uh, characteristic of learning. So there seems to be two types of learning. And uh, you know, the question would be to ask, is there any way we could uh, uh, you know, uh, nail some uh, specific ideas? Now, this kind of generalization and learning that I talked to, oh, it's backwards. Uh, started at 12, 10, 12, 15. Uh, this kind of uh, learning techniques that I spoke about are actually also uh, uh, present and is experimentally observed even in you know, birds and animals. Here is an excellent example that Edelman is quoting. Um, uh, does anyone know where is the focus button? Anyway, uh, here uh, there is uh, some experiments done by Sorella where uh, the experimenter was able to train a pigeon to identify a particular type of oak leaf, you know, which is not one of them. The top three rows of the, these oak leaves. And the pigeon was trained to identify one other uh, type of oak leaf. And then uh, the same pigeon was have, uh, asked to choose the o uh, different uh, strains of the oak leaf from other kinds of leaves that are similar. And the pigeon was able to do it in, in every instant. So, and uh, that's an ex uh, extremely important aspect of this that I think I would also uh, read, that Edelman comments, that if one is inclined to think that this finding was perhaps the result of some evolutionarily or ethologically determined ability, or a hidden cue not obvious to the experimenter, then one must confront Herrenstein's results demonstrating similar generalizing capacities of pigeons that were presented with images of water, of female figures, of trees, and even of fish. So uh, even very low level organisms that, uh, you know, at least let's say let's talk about birds and animals which uh, apparently have, uh, and I, uh, I suppose uh, even uh, Searle agreed that his dog is conscious. He's not sure about frogs. But I suppose he, would, he wouldn't mind go down a little bit further and accept uh, birds are also conscious. And uh, so conscious systems seem to have this ability which is remarkably completely absent in uh, computing systems that, uh, you know, okay. So let's see where we are going. Now Edelman, of course, however, says, and obviously this means 
that uh, systems that have brains must have some special capacity that systems that don't have brains uh, you know, don't have. So he argues that the reason why computing systems cannot do this kind of generalization, uh, which uh, we and even pigeons can do, is because brains actually are seen to have uh, non-hardwired connections. A computer is typically hardwired, whereas the brains, uh, he, he suggests that we have uh, neuronal groups uh, and there is connections, uh, intraneuronal, intergroups and inter, uh, intergroup and intragroup connections that evolve during, even during our lifetime. So he suggests that this kind of, uh, the evolution of connections in the brain throughout our lifetime is uh, probably the thing that gives us the capacity to generalize. Now, I, I wish to argue, I wish to show rather, um, that here is a specific example. Oops, let me make it a bit more interesting. Um, here is a specific example of a generalist, uh, of, uh, you know, natural language processing, which I shall show a bit later, can be done by implementing the scheme of evolving connections by software, and still we have problems. And this is, here is a sentence. I saw the man on the hill with a telescope. <coughs> And obvious, uh, normally most of us would think of it as being this. This is a meaning. But it could also be this. Or it could also be something like this. <laughs> or it could also be something like this. You know, that I saw the man on the hill, there were many hills, one hill had a telescope. Or it could be that you just met him on the street and he said, oh, he's the same man I saw the other day with the telescope, right? So that at the time of being spoken, you know, uh, the whole meaning has, the sentence has a different context. Now, how would you extract this kind of a thing? Of course, uh, this particular thing was presented, um, I think, in uh, 1984 at the AAA conference. And a scheme for this was also solving this class of problems was, was shown by uh, the frame uh, techniques. Uh -huh. Could I just get uh, my transparencies? Sorry, the pad of transparencies? No, next, next, no, the, before, right. That's right. I, I shall just try to show here how this can be done. I didn't quite make a slide because it needs to be shown in its evolving phase. So what we can typically do is that we can have a scheme where the system actually starts with no uh, under, uh, you know, nodes, or, but it has a general scheme of trying to have nodes and then relate, uh, you know, uh, have sub-properties in sub nodes for each node, and then to start building connections and descriptions and things of the sort. So when a sentence of this sort comes, you know, the system is trained to, uh, can be trained by an uh, expert to say, oh, why don't you open three nodes, one for the telescope, and one for the seeing person, and one for the seeing person, right? And it, uh, let's say, uh, and then it's, it's asking, okay, uh, well, I still don't see any relationship. Uh, what kind of node I should, property should I uh, think about in order to get a relationship? And he says, well, why don't you have coordinates, right? Then it, it starts a node called coordinates and then asks, uh, give me the coordinates for the telescope, the seeing person, the seeing person, and those data are given. And in this way, you know, the system develops. You know. It's kind of a scheme, you know, using frame techniques is done. And it does actually then um, interpret the system, you know, pretty nicely. But then the same type of system was given something else. A uh, sentence of this type, you know, time flies like an arrow, right? And then uh, it comes up with a straight interpretation. It doesn't uh, say that there are some type of flies called time flies and they're like arrows. You know. <laughs> now the real important point that I'm trying to make here, and uh, I shouldn't dwell on it too much, is that when you have a K-intensive system, actually, K-intensive system, the real point is that the system has a certain domain within which its knowledge is context relevant. It can actually sense context. But when it gets a new uh, uh, you know, input for which its current knowledge is no longer relevant, it has no way of knowing that it has got something that it cannot deal with. So it actually processes it with the existing data and actually comes up with some undependable answer. This is actually a fundamental problem with expert systems, which is why you just can't go all the way because they're undependable. This means that given any k-intensive system, which is a formal system, there are always undesirable propositions which are in principle within the system not noticeable. You know, there's some kind of a remarkable echo of a Gert, you know, the Gödel's theorem, but I just uh, you know uh, what it is. I suppose uh, I, I would just leave it as uh, you know. Um, at this point. 
Okay, so then we go into the, and a possible objection can be made. People could say, oh, well, uh, you know, you're, we're talking about, we are able to build this kind of abilities in machines, and we also see that they have limitations. But it's really no big deal, because aren't human beings are also limited? You know, uh, it's not that all of us can solve all kinds of context, you know. The answer to this is a no on two counts. One is a little bit uh, simple. That's the fact that, think of a simple example, like there's a child in a, who goes to second grade, and uh, you have a PhD in mathematics. Now, obviously, uh, the person who has a PhD in mathematics can solve many, many problems that the child cannot solve. And so we say that this person knows much more mathematics than the child. But it's equally true that there's a whole class of problems that both of them cannot solve. You know? Now, this doesn't mean that they are in the same category. So what I would suggest is actually the cognitive spectrum, you know, is a broad one. And I would suggest that the I-intensive approach places us at, at one end, and the K-intensive approach is at the other end. We seem to be hovering more in this area than in this area, you know. That's the point we are making. But none of us could claim that, you know, we, we are all in this edge. We may be there, but we tend to go more this way than this way, you know. This is the kind of fundamental difference I suggest that, you know, we should acknowledge and try to account for in a theory of mind. You know. Now, so we talk about, generally, of course, logical positivism is out of fashion, right? So, so people don't know, in that kind of a scheme, right, uh, consciousness is an epiphenomena, it has a passive role, and it just simply arises as a function of structure. Now, uh, materialistic theories since then have gone, uh, grown a little bit more sophisticated, and we try to say, no, no, no. We accept that uh, the mind and consciousness, they do have an important role to play, but they are basically dependent on our, you know, uh, it's a function of structure. So, but one thing that we would notice is that no materialistic theory of mind can be consistently materialistic. In the, si in the sense that at some point of time, we ought to introduce certain assumptions that cannot be subsumed uh, on a mechanistic basis. Um, I'm saying that ad hoc non-mechanistic assumptions need to be invoked at one point or another. Without much comment, I'll just uh, point out three things. We saw yesterday in Dr. Staff's presentation that in order to build a quantum theory of consciousness, he has assigned uh, at the quality of a field to the act. Now, we, we ought to ask, what is this field? You know, it's not exactly consciousness, but it has got to be. You know. So if you want to put a field there, why not consciousness? We don't know. But at least that's a minimal way in which we want to uh, kind of steal some aspect of consciousness in order to start a theory of consciousness. So we might say that maybe there is some fundamentally irreducible aspect of cognition that we need to kind of throw in there in order to even start talking about consciousness. So why don't we then treat consciousness itself as that and start building a theory of cognition? That's a possibility. I also kind of observe, of course, I'm not very sure whether I'm representing Dr. Staff's idea properly, but this is what I think, and I might well be wrong. And the same way it also occurred to me that Dr. Kyron Smith was presenting, he's acknowledging the idea that consciousness cannot be purely an end product of evolution, uh, you know, suddenly. You know, there got to be some precedent, some precursor for consciousness right from the beginning in order for that to appear at the, uh, later. So if you don't want to postulate consciousness as something that's existing all times, Let's say that something is proto-conscious. You know. Now, another valiant way to actually uh, try to subsume consciousness within the materialistic infrastructure is emergence theory, where we say that, oh, well, at some level of the structure, the thing comes up. You know. But the real question to ask is, is the world completely uh, mediated by the laws of nature or not? If it is yes, then whatever you call as emergent has to have some mechanistic basis. If not, why say emergence? You know. One could argue like that. And of course, we also saw Dr. Searle yesterday give a, a very a new twist to this whole attempt by saying that both uh, naive, uh, he suggested that, you know, why, you know, we just have to accept that consciousness exists in the brain, just as we have interest rates and football scores. You know, why even uh, talk about it? So he's uh, definitely fed up with naive dualism and naive materialism, uh, monism, and he suggests let's be instead just naive. <laughs> Is this? Okay. I'm, I'm, try, I'm now trying to go into my final phase, I'm kind of trying to land here. So, um, 12, 10, 12, I have what, 40 minutes, 50, 14 minutes to go, all right. 
So the pro uh, one observation that we can make is that actually the brain behaves exactly like a computer. You know, this is kind of a slight inversion, you know, more along the lines of what Sol suggested. Uh, the inversion is that we generally tend to think that the, brain, the computer works like a brain. But actually, of course, we have designed a computer, the, the computing device has come up, quite without reference to the brain. And we see at some point in time, we see a lot of parallels now, because now we consciously try to borrow some ideas from brain structures. They, uh, the brain behaves like a computer in the sense, the brain executes a particular program just as a computer executes one of several stored programs. Yeah, you see that. You go inside a computer, you turn it on, there's all kinds of programs, words for our intro, our database, and you try to execute a particular program. The brain also, it's not that you see, suppose I reach out and, you know, grab this pen. It's not like the brain is constantly generating, you know, different kinds of motions, and then you suddenly grab and reach one. When a particular act is there, a whole specific sequence of action is initiated in the uh, brain and it goes. So the proposal that I wish to make is that just as a programmer instantiates the computer by a program, the mind instantiates the brain with a, you know, with a program. One could say like that. You know, what's the evidence for this? It's practical experience. We can see that the mind is always contemplating, generating possible actions. You know, this lecture is really boring. Should I go for lunch? You know. Or, you know, and if so, you suddenly see, you get up and walk away. Somebody says, oh, yeah, it's boring, but I can't go to lunch because uh, they won't serve lunch till the lecture is over. I made sure of that, <laughs> right? <laughs> now, incidentally, I was supposed to make that announcement, so. Um, you know, so you do something else, you, know, you yawn. So in this way, well, <laughs> so the point is that the mind is constantly contemplating different kinds of activities, and then suddenly you seize on one activity, and the brain executes it. So it, to me, it seems like a credible scenario. However, a, an objection can be made. This objection is that people might say, oh, well, this is not quite true because even if you're sitting in a place and silently thinking, you could still see that the brain, you know, five portions of the brain that are firing. You know. So the answer for this is to say that even if it be that specific thoughts are also stored programs in the brain, still wading through and selecting specifically a program is an act of instantiation by the mind. Let me explain that. It's just like, let's assume that you start a word star program, right? And it comes up and it says, well, what do you want to do on drive A or drive B? And you say drive B. And immediately you see the drive B is coming up. And then you say, what are the different kinds of... So you're actually wading through different, different types of things which are all definitely programs stored in the computer. But every time, actually, the selection of a particular branch of the program is an instantiation that's being done by the programmer. And I don't think it's a very trivial point that you can really ignore. So we, uh, why, why don't we draw upon this and also say then that mind is doing the similar kind of instantiation, in which case we can also relate to the fact that even as the mind is instantiating, the brain is still actually having, I mean, even when the mind doesn't instantiate, still the brain, I know, one can actually think of brain activity. Now, this is one way of looking at it. So what is the proposal here? I'm getting down a little bit further here. The proposal is that mind is actively generating the space of all activities. I, I think I'll just cut this out to make it more clear. Uh, the brain executes a, spe a specific act at any given time by the will of the mind. Let's say like that. So the idea that I really want to say is then that we have a situation of symbol processing. And that is actually the property of both the brain and the computer, this idea. And certainly, the computer is nowhere near in complexity to the brain. You know. So there is a lot of room, even in the current level of symbol processing, to make heck of a lot of uh, advancement by you know, borrowing from the structures of the brain and doing things. It's certainly possible, and I think it's going to happen. You know, it's already happening, and we'll make progress. And there will be a great category of problems in which we'll make further progress than we do now. But still, my feeling is that certain fundamental aspects of cognition you know, will still remain intractable within the machine, you know, as they have remained over the last 30, 40 years during the course of AI development. So the suggestion I like to make is, let's, you know, since I propose that the brain is actually uh, in being instantiated by the mind, similarly, we need to have an instantiating structure within the computer, you know, the, oh, thank you so much, within the computer that does the same job, you know. And I call this level a symbol generation for some reasons that I hope to make it clear in the next few slides. And uh, this level, of course, would require, I have made a note, and I shall elaborate on it a little bit later, material but non-physical, you know, mind technology. 
you know, the kind of work that Dr. John was doing and uh, you know, many others have done. And I, I suppose it, it should be a new genre of uh, you know, research, I would think. And I feel that actually the price that we wish to pay, uh, uh, I, um, let me rephrase it all well. The price that we want to avoid to pay in, uh, in formulating a mind as a level of matter that interacts with the brain and instantiate it, uh, in the fear that it may not be uh, within the ambit of current science, uh, is really not too high because by doing this, we get a model for the way we work which is much less contraintuitive. You know, we, we do that, we actually have intentions, we really see that there are certain ways in which actually we think and we control our body. And uh, if it's probably pursued systematically, which I hope to do in the next few slides, uh, I don't think uh, it need to remain uh, very, uh, you know, uh, elusive or uh, like woolly. Now, in the next few slides, I'm trying to uh, show some ideas. I, uh, these are not in exactly philosophical. Uh, at the same time, these are not scientific. Probably they are pre-scientific. Uh, it's just trying to point at a domain of possibilities. And it is by exploring these domains of possibilities that we can make progress. So I, I, the idea of the symbol generation that I want to uh, invoke here is something like this. <coughs> Consider uh, you know, uh, an ordinary car. You know, it's just I'm trying to sh give an example. You have the uh, chassis. Is that the way how you say that? Chassis. You have the chassis and the transmission system and the car itself, and that actually moves, right? But you see that there is uh, not, uh, basically it doesn't have the capacity to generate motion. That's actually in the engine. The engine is, of course, a very uh, simple device. All you have is, an, uh, you know, uh, a pist an in piston that's going inside the engine back and forth, and it produces a small delta x motion, which is connected to the wheel, and it's just being linearly uh, set out, and there's motion. So we see the structure here. The engine is constantly producing some basic unit of motion that's being applied to the body. And then there is motion. But then to, for this to go in a particular direction, you have clutch gear controls and all these kinds of mechanisms by which you do it. So one can actually think of the cognitive uh, structure for the human being in terms of the body, including the brain. And the mind is a generator of the space of, you know, the general space of, uh, you know, activities, which in the subtlest term is thought. So one could think of thought as basically gross activity, but in a subtler realm. There's really no difference. And then the intelligence actually selects any one particular uh, thought in, a, in, a, in, a, in accordance with some overall goal, and it's instantiated on the body-brain mechanism, and then we get what is called behavior. Of course, when a car is from here to there, the car itself doesn't know that it's going to Los Angeles. You know. It's actually the driver who knows that. So similarly, we say that the perception of this particular pattern of uh, the, uh, some movement as behavior is actually done by consciousness. You know, we can say that consciousness holds the context. You know, the, the idea that I was telling you earlier, how the generalization and categorization skills need uh, the ability to hold basically a context, you know, which is a, you know, a fundamental trait of consciousness. When you have this eye, you can hold the context to your environment. So we can say that, that that's related to that. That's an idea. If you want to really go into the symbol processing metaphor, this is actually what I'm saying is the brain is a symbol processing level, the mind is a symbol generation level, and the intelligence is selecting the symbols in, in accordance with the overall problem at hand, and that's actually the whole thing is guided by consciousness. That's an idea uh, that we can consider. Now, I, um, of course, uh, a question that one could raise, uh, there are two points that I wish to point out here that are very important. The first is a traditional thing. Oh, are you going to introduce the little green man again? You know. So the little green man argument, I think, is a, some kind of a straw man argument. It really was put up by Ryle and others when nobody said it. And then they knocked it down. Uh, this is quite similar to seeing when you see a computer and it's doing some program and doing some wonderful response on an interactive, you know, let's say an online program. And you say, gee, who made this program? And you say, well, so-and-so did it. Joe Blow did it. Really? Are you trying to tell me there's a little green man called Joe Blow uh, sitting inside the computer? No. He's not a little green man inside the computer, but he's a little green man outside. <laughs> you know, it is there. 
So this uh, actually the point we are talking about is that there are differences in ontology when we speak of mind and matter. It's just like, I, I, I try to invoke, let me invoke one more example. And uh, in fact, I should have made a slide because there were two arguments to this I had. The second one I forgot. Maybe we'll come back. The idea, when I mean different ontological categories, is something like, you know, you have, this is an example I often use, uh, let's assume that you have a particular object in between two mirrors. And you see an infinity of reflections, right? And then you can ask, what is that, uh, where is that image caused by? You say it's caused by this image. And you ask, where, what is that image caused by? By this image. Finally, you come to this thing and you say, what is that image caused by? The first one, by this object. And you say, well, it's in which mirror? The answer is, it's not in any mirror because it's not an image. It's a different kind of thing from, actually, uh, the images. The same way when we speak of a mind that interacts with the brain, uh, the idea is that it's, uh, um, it's, we're talking about another kind of conception of matter. You know, this is the suggestion I'm trying to make. And um, of course, I, as you would notice, I'm, uh, uh, I'm stressing the fact that I'm proposing mind as a level of matter. It's not, you know, consciousness, uh, of course, necessarily in this ontology, remains as something irreducible into matter, and therefore it's a fundamentally of a different ontological category than the matter. So the scheme is that consciousness is there, it's different from matter, and at different levels of structures of matter, we see different kinds of conscious activities manifest. You know, uh, it's just like uh, the, idea, the idea I'm trying to give is uh, like the gears. What gears? The relationship between gears and IC chips. Just take a look at that. If you look at a Z80 microprocessor. In principle, the logic of the system can be reproduced with, you know, gears and levers in a, in a Babbage type of machine in principle. But if you want to really do that, you probably would end up with a machine that will occupy the whole of the planet, you know, even if it had just four or five instructions in its, uh, you know, instruction set, and uh, consume power that probably uh, the whole of the universe cannot supply in order to operate it. So when you go into the level of IC chips, you see that you get speed and power advantages, which are because it's happening at a level uh, that's different from this level. You can't take gears and hope to make them smaller and smaller and smaller and come to IC chips. The same way, you can't hope to take IC chips and make them smaller and smaller with nanotechnology and go to mind. No. You'll get better performance with nanotechnology, but you just won't be able to create mind. Because to create mind, I'm suggesting you need to have basically you know, symbol generating capacities. Now, obviously, that's an, you know, that's, a, that's an aspect of which I have a lot of ideas. It's something that I'm working on, some ongoing research. Uh, that, that would require, you know, a much greater elucidation. The time is short. The topic is very vast and profound. <laughs> and mistakes are expectable. <laughs> yeah? okay. Okay. All right. Let me cover it up with my last slide. Now, the only point that I wish to make now is that I just tried to give you some kind of a logical system within which you can think of this mind as something different from the brain. It's not very illogical. And to really get into this, we need more work. You know, in any field, when new ideas come up, you need to follow them through, you know. So I, I, I only think that, you know, there's more work that's needed. But I would like to just quote it, I mean, end it by quoting uh, some text from the ancient uh, you know, Vedic text that seem to remarkably uh, tally with the kind of ideas they have said purely from, let us say, uh, uh, the kind of problems we, ha we have and the way computers work and the way we see mind working. When you propose mind is instantiating the brain and we go up like that. And here is uh, one quote. Uh, I'm really sorry about this. I hope you're going to be able to <laughs> erase this. Uh, the individual consciousness is the passenger in the... Uh, is there any space? Oh, okay. Don't worry about it. That's better. The individual consciousness is the passenger in the chariot of the material body, and the intelligence is the driver. Mind is the driving instrument, and the senses are the horses. The self is thus the enjoyer or the sufferer in the association of the mind and the senses. So it is understood by great thinkers. Yeah. And here is another statement from the Gita, Bhagavad Gita, which says, solid this is dull matter, you know, in some sense. Uh, so the bo functioning body is superior to ordinary unstructured matter, but mind is higher than the, you know, structured matter, and intelligence is still higher than the mind, 
and the conscious self is even higher than the intelligence. You know, so we have you know, some kind of a basis here. Now, of course, one can say, throw all this out, this is nonsense, but then we have to really think. If we are willing to throw you know, knowledge that's around for hundreds of th you know, years, then uh, what right do we have to expect that our own knowledge that we have in science wouldn't be thrown you know, by the next decade comes around? So it's, it's a profound form, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, issue, and I think we ought to have uh, s uh, some kind of uh, um, thinking about it. And I just wish to conclude uh, by just pointing out that the hierarchical model I'm presenting uh, is a superset of the materialistic theories. And I, I'm not denying, actually, that uh, the materialistic knowledge that we are getting is irrelevant. Actually, it is possible that we can stay in the domain of symbol processing and we can take this computer more and more closer to the brain and we'll get a lot of you know, advancement, technological advancement. But we still wouldn't be able to solve the fundamental problem of cognition. And so I'm saying, therefore, this is a superset. And I'm saying that it provides directions also for potential mind research. You know. And it is also, in its idea of consciousness, it's very relevant to the quantum measurement problem, which, of course, is again a whole different uh, bag. And I just wish to claim that it's possible to do that. And also with this worldview, it's easier to relate this model to other observed phenomena, such as mind-brain interaction that John uh, uh, yesterday presented, and out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, and things like that, which are really very well documented. You know, we are, uh, so we, we can actually account for them without you know, dismissing them. You know, no hand-waving is required. And also, if one goes a little deeper into the what is the consciousness that's being topped out there, one can talk about uh, larger issues of life. You know. So that is my presentation, and I'm open to now questions. Thank you very much. All right. All right, we're open for questions. So, did I save some time? You did very well. All right, okay. Hmm. Uh, the first question is, are mind, brain, and intelligence all levels of consciousness? Is consciousness all inclusive? Thank you. Uh, before I start, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, Jean Burns, my friend here. She gave uh, me a lot of uh, help in actually preparing this talk and making it very focused because it is a very big domain to deal with. I would like to acknowledge that. Now with that, are mind, brain, and intelligence all levels of consciousness? See, the idea, that I'm, now if I want to go a little further, is that actually consciousness and matter are two different kinds of energies. And consciousness, uh, as energies, both have capacity to do work, is the first idea. But consciousness, because it's sentient, can do work on its own and make matter work, but matter cannot. Very similarly to a driver of a car. The driver can move on his own or move through the car, but the car cannot move on its own. So when we really say, can machines think, the emphasis is often usually on machines or thinking. But I would like to shift the emphasis to can. It's like saying, can a plane fly, as opposed to what? A car. Well, if you mean that using a car you cannot fly, but using a plane you can fly, the answer is yes. But you say, can a plane fly on its own unlike a car, the answer is no. So when you say, can machines think, the answer is yes, if you say that if there's a suitable level of material structure by which consciousness can act, then consciousness, consciousness can manifest itself as, you know, thinking in its thinking phase. So what I suggest is consciousness is an integral, holistic domain of existence in which all qualities are intrinsically present, but they can be separated out into matter depending upon the structure of matter. For example, as conscious person, I can move, but I can impart that motion also to this. But in order to impart it, it must have proper structure. If it's too heavy, I can't do that. The same way thinking is nothing but consciousness but when manifested in matter at the level of thinking. So what I, uh, when I say mind, intelligence, and body, we really mean different levels of structures in which it is appropriately consciousness is manifest. Ultimately, it's consciousness. Just like if I throw this object, if I throw it from here to there, although the object is moving, the perception of that movement is in me, not in the object. 
So the same way, just like motion is, it doesn't have intrinsically semantic content. The pen doesn't think I'm going that way. That semantic content is a superimposition by my consciousness. The same way thinking also has no semantic content. Thinking is simply a material process at a much subtler level. But that I'm thinking this way or that way is only meaningful to the conscious observer who is perturbing the mind. So another point is that when I throw this, actually, after throwing it, I can move separately. The same way, even though consciousness makes the mind think, the consciousness can still think independently. But that thinking is nothing other than consciousness. Actually, that's the principle of yoga. Although the mind is really thinking, you can actually you know, detach yourself from that. So the mind may be happy or sad, but you can be about the duality. But in order to be able to do that, you have to have a very clear perception of all these different mechanisms. It's a very subtle talk, I mean, subtle idea. Can a mind use a silicon-based artificial computer like it can use an organic brain? Can a mind use a silicon-based artificial computer like it can use an organic brain? I, mm. So I, woo. <laughs> can a mind use a, yeah, so what he's trying to ask is, can we program a computer, I guess. No, what he's trying, no. The question is, can the mind directly use a computer, the silicon-based computer, instead of using the organic brain? That's the whole idea. But can you directly program it without well, keyboard? Say, and, say, oh, yeah. Can a mind use a silicon-based artificial computer like it can use an organic brain? Mm. Well, again, I, I don't pretend, however, that I, I have given you a model, right? I have 20 years of training in computer science. I've used that, and I have tried to use my studies from, you know, my familiarity with the Vedic text to put together, you know, because I am working in this field. Now, let me not claim that I know all the concepts that I've used here. You know, I just first wanted to say that. And I have some feel for these things, but it's a very profound topic, and I barely know maybe even, you know, one percent of the concepts that are being taught. But I think this point I made is valid. What I call as a brain, as opposed to a computer, is actually the structure. That's all. If that structure is present, the mind can interact, you know. So we don't distinguish between mind, uh, brain, and computer in terms of whether it's silicon-based or it's uh, you know, uh, carbon-based. The, the real idea is the proper structure must be present. Just like when you have a car and I say uh, the wheels, the engine, and the steering wheel, there is really no difference between the engine and the car. They are all both made of material elements. But you call it an engine because of its functional position in the whole structure. So whether you say mind or whether you say brain or body, they're all material. But they are called mind or body because of the functional position they occupy in this cognitive hierarchy. But consciousness, we wish to suggest, is non-material. Now, what that means is, again, uh, a deeper thing. Uh, I started at 12.10, so I suppose I can go up to 1.10. So I, right? One hour. OK, so I'll, I'll just take questions for 10 more minutes. Can logical, let me just quickly go through this and then see which are the ones we should have. Can logical descriptions invite emotional? Can logical stroke rational thinking descriptions and in intuitive emotional feeling expressions be seen as two separate types of data processing systems? Mm. Uh, not really, uh, because I, I just have uh, some slides here if I can reach out for them. Yeah? All right, okay. So the idea is that I have argued already that feelings and emotions, they imply a base of activity that's quite different from the way the mind works. Yeah. Uh, if so, the second question, so it is not if so, therefore it's not you know, applicable. No, I don't think that uh, they can be both subsumed under the same uh, idea. Please send prints of the printer. Printed statements, definitions you presented near the end of your presentation, thanks, will do. Okay, what similarities can you see between the structure of the brain and the structure of the computer? Do you think that the brain is a programmable machine? Yes, it, not only it is a programmable machine, it is being programmed, it is being instantiated by the mind. The structure of the brain and the structure of the computer, uh, this is, uh, 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 is a very difficult question because um, um, I don't know uh, how the brain is structured. That's a reasonable answer. It's very difficult. Actually, I was going to start with an answer, and I kind of changed, have changed track. Well, I can't talk about it, but it'll take me too far away. Let me just simply say that uh, there are uh, 
suggestions or hints in the source from which I am drawing this model for connections between the mind and the brain that involve what is called senses, you know, which is very subtle. It's just like um, if I put a, a sheet of uh, iron now here and if you touch it, I don't quite feel you touching me. Whereas if I touch here the skin, I feel. So the, actually the skin is also you know, a material thing. So the, the real reason is actually one can think between the, uh, you know, between the skin and actually the perception level. There are certain subtler processes involved, but these are, and I can just speak about it, but they'll have no uh, basis and it's, it's very difficult. Who tells the driver to drive in your analogy? Well, the driver is conscious. Yeah, uh, who tells the driver to drive in your analogy? This is very important. It's a very good question. Actually, it, what, what it raises is intentionality. If, ma if m movements and matter are not intrinsically intentional, then even if you concede causality for consciousness, how is it intentional? Now the answer is, consciousness by definition is conscious. So when it is actually acting, you know, when it's moving, it's the same kind of energy as matter. You know, we'll have to probe this further. But when it moves, it in, you know, it's obviously intentional because it wants to move. Because by definition, consciousness is intentional, all its activities are intentional. So when you say who tells the driver, in this case consciousness to drive, it's consciousness itself because it's intentional by its very nature. So that means by saying uh, consciousness in all its manifestive faces actually eliminates the problem of intentionality and everything else because it's intending to act on its own. Will you comment on parallel processing technology in mimicking intelligence? Again, let's not use these words you know, equivocally. Descartes did that. Descartes said mind, intelligence. In the West, the dualism uh, suffers from the problem that within the idea of a mind different from the brain, you lump all cognitive traits, right? But we are actually talking in different ways. We talk about uh, the body as the level at which a specific, you know, act is carried out. We talk about the mind as the level at which the space of activities is generated. We talk about intelligence as a level at which a specific activity is plucked and, you know, passed on to the body. It's like a control mechanism. So these are different. Now, one little idea I can give, however, is if you take the present computer, you know, uh, let me just uh, give this, I have six minutes. The idea is, who took this uh, thing away? <laughs> okay, anyway, so I have some interesting slides. Um, the idea is, um, consider a real apple, you know, and a plastic apple, and the painting of an apple. It's a bit of an important idea I'm trying to say. You can see that the real apple has several qualities. L you know, color, weight, texture, taste. And if you go to a plastic apple, you can produce the color exactly, the weight also exactly, the texture also exactly, but you can't produce taste. But if you go to a pa painting of an apple, you can produce the color, but not the shape, only in two dimensions. And the weight, not at all, and taste, not at all. So you can see that it's actually like a mapping, or just like you take a sphere and you map it on a plane. Sphere has got three, uh, attributes, right? The diameter, the uh, circumference, and volume. And you project it on a plane, you get a circle. It has only a diameter and a circumference. The volume is gone. And you project it again on a plane, you get a circle which has only a line. And both the diameter and the circumferences are gone. The same way what I'm saying is consciousness is already our consciousness. Our intelligence is already artificial because it's mechanical intelligence. So consciousness is acting through that intelligence. And that is the level of a plastic apple, like three-dimensional. It can produce more qualities. So consciousness has four qualities. Consciousness, intelligence, mind, and form, which are non-distinguishable. Three of which can be produced in matter at this level. You know, intelligence, mind, and body. But in a computer, you have the body. You have robotic extensions of a good approximation. And then the processor, to me, represents a mapping of mind and intelligence together. And the key to that is actually the stored program concept of Neumann. You know. So I would say that uh, you could actually go, you know, uh, further and further and further, and you could have, uh, you know, different uh, categories of uh, machine structures that would uh, more closely implement um, our cognitive faculties. I'll just show one important slide, and then I should be done with it then. Oh, here it is. What I'm trying to say here is, you see, right now we have 
a computer. You know, you could have serial processors we have now. We can introduce massively parallel nets. It'll be a bigger system. But the human designer and the programmer are, are supplying all three things. You know, and this mind and intelligence are actually mapped on by the stored program. Probably we can have another technology where the stored program itself gets stored one more, another enfoldment. You know, and I think we will go further. So we could go a little bit further and talk about a machine with serial process and parallel nets and mind also. Still, intelligence and consciousness will be supplied by us. We can go a little further and talk about serial processes, parallel nets, and mind and intelligence also in a material system, but still consciousness we would be supplying. That's the idea. In fact, there is a book called Machines That Can Think by McCordock, and there she gives a historical review of uh, the concepts of robots, and she quotes interestingly enough from an Indian text called Vamana Purana, and then she says that, you can refer to that book, she says that in the court of Indra, the passage runs, there is a machine that receives people, makes them seated, talks to them nicely, gives them drinks, and keeps them engaged till Indra comes. It practically can do everything except have feelings. You know. So it, it is a passage like that. Now, I don't know what that means, but I don't, you know, I, I suppose, you know, you could do those things, but these require extremely keen understanding and grasp of the subtle principles involved in our different levels of matter. So my comment on parallel processing is, yeah, as we get better machines, Oh, we can. Is consciousness superior to mind? Yes. Uh, yes. Mind is a subtler level of matter through which consciousness can produce more things than through the body. Just like if I was a pilot and you gave me a car, I cannot fly. The same way consciousness has all capabilities, but matter has to be organized at proper levels in order for consciousness to be able to manifest. That's why we say someone is more intelligent in the sense that he has a better mechanical structure you know, uh, compared to somebody else, you know, that's the idea, okay. Connectionist models are extremely good at categorizing uh, uh, in a human-like way. No, that's a wrong statement. They are good, but not extremely good, and fundamentally, and besides, all connectionist models are basically implemented on serial machines. Besides, you know, all neural networks at present are basically curve-fitting, you know, uh, procedures. So I don't really think they're fundamentally different from serial machines. Of course, they say that they're going to get, you know, I, I suppose in a year or so, we expect some neural chips to come out. But I basically don't think that if they don't go past the curve fitting ideas, it's something fundamental is being added. All I'm saying is more technology is being added, more brain-like structures we are discovering. So we will have better performance, but I don't think we'll be able to solve categorization and generalization problems. Further, they are not very much knowledge intensive. Yeah, I'll grant that, but still produce Primitive intelligent behavior. Mm. Now, the real idea, and uh, I, I'm trying to say here, it's probably uh, the real idea I'm trying to say here is something like this. Think of a, a program as a graph, right? It starts for different inputs, actually. You put all the different nodes, different possible ways in which the program can terminate as different nodes. Think of a program like that. So, you know, your go to's can be all paths like this, you know. So you can actually have the whole computer as I mean, the, the program put as a graph. Then, then you can describe this as having n nodes, each of which has a connectivity c i, i equal to 1 to n, right? Then my, I, my claim is that no number of repeated executions of this program, which, by which I mean traversing this graph, would change either the n or the c i of any node. Either, neither the number of nodes or the degree of connectivity. I don't think it can really generate, you know, new uh, nodes. This is the idea I'm saying. So the, uh, the point is that we may go into different, different uh, levels of uh, material technology, but I don't think we will produce categorization possibilities because I do accept Edelman's idea that, you know, evolving new connections is a requisition for these ideas. And uh, unless you produce a mind, I don't think that's possible, that's the idea. Otherwise, I think Edelman's concept is very perceptive. You know, and he says that there's evolving connections. But simulating those evolution of connections, like I showed you with the natural language problem, problem using current technology is not the answer. Do you suggest that consciousness superseded the material before matter was created, assuming there was a beginning? Um, according to, uh, well, this more, obviously I'll have to go a little bit more metaphysical here. According to uh, the model here, both consciousness and matter are eternally existing. But it is the interaction between consciousness and matter that is being mediated by time, you know. So there's nothing like superseding, you know. It's nothing like superseding. 
you know, an example can be given like if you have a fire and there is heat coming from it, right? There is never a time when there is fire without heat or heat without fire. But still if you say, oh, it's really warm, where is it coming from? You say it comes from the fire. You never say the fire is coming from the heat. But so although they are simultaneously coexisting, uh, one can say that the heat is coming from the fire. The same way consciousness and matter are coexisting at all times, still we say the impetus to activity in matter comes from consciousness, because consciousness is active. It's a bit of a deep idea. I'm, very, I'm kind of taking you into the first steps of Vedic arguments, you know, how, how you think about actually reality. What kind of future do you see for strong AI research in hardware and software? Well, you know, there's all kinds of things going on. For example, I know a professor who is at uh, University of Detroit, uh, well, at least I used to know him when I was there, who is doing work in uh, uh, biological chips. The idea is that, you see, if, uh, same idea. It's a good question, uh, it's a nice question. The idea is that if you have uh, fixed configuration machines, you are not going to be able to produce free will. So what he is doing is that he takes them, instead of having a matrix of ones and zero elements, you know, your um, bistable, multivibrator kind of thing, you take a matrix of very primitive uh, organisms, like amoebas, where it's primitive. You have a, you know, matrix, and you connect to either ends of them probes, right, and in, in the compartment. Now, when this amoeba is curled in, it's not connected. The connection is not made. That's zero. When it curls out, you know, when it connects, it's one. And extremely mild forms of current technology is used so that the organism doesn't really suffer, according to that idea. And then what happens when you actually want to make one particular bit go on? You send a pulse. Now, the funny thing is this amoeba sometimes curls out, sometimes it tolerates and says, oh, what the heck, all this stay there. <laughs> you know, so sometimes the connection is made and sometimes it's not made. So then you have actually some kind of an indeterministic machine that you make, you know. And this is now actually a uh, uh, you know, program. And the kind of programming technology you use is very soft, uh, very sophisticated. There's a lot of mathematical ideas that are used to do fault-tolerant computing. And they have a machine like that. But basically, in our model, even this amoeba is a low-level structure with which the same kind of consciousness that I have is associated. Again, it's like the idea. We don't say, does amoeba have consciousness? We say consciousness as an amoeba body, or consciousness as a human body. You know? So my question, again, my pointing out that in order to, again, produce a materialistic uh, uh, idea for consciousness, you still have to use an organic substrate, which actually has consciousness in it. Now, this, this kind of ideas are going on, far out ideas. There are more ideas. I don't want to get into them that are going better, on in different places. I think we'd better call a halt now that we have Gomata's Can amoeba. I have one sentence? No, Gomata's amoeba have replaced uh, Schrodinger's cat. Let me just is use that, one sentence, uh, one concluding sentence. All right, go ahead. So well. my final comment is that uh, it's like a ladder you know, inside a well. You know, we are in the middle of that well, in that ladder, in the sense we have already a material intelligence. Do you use it to go further down or to go further up? That's the idea. So we'll have to think, what is the agenda of AI? That's a question for Weizenbaum. Thank you.